Okay, welcome back, everyone. I first met our next speaker, Richard Dolan, at the National UFO Conference back in October of last year and found Richard to be very charming and extremely knowledgeable in his subject. He holds a MA in history from the University of Rochester and a BA in history from the Alfred University. He earned a certificate in political theory from Oxford University and was a Rhodes Scholar finalist. Prior to his interest in anomalous phenomena, Richard studied US Cold War strategy, Soviet history, and international diplomacy. And in 2000, he published a 500-page study, UFOs and the National Security State. This is the first volume of a two-part historical narrative of the national security dimensions of the UFO phenomena from 1941 to the present. Included are the records of more than 50 military bases relating to innumerable violations of sensitive airspace by unknown objects, demonstrating that the US military has taken the topic of UFOs very seriously indeed. Dr. Edgar Mitchell has called Richard's book monumental. Why Dr. Hal Puthoff, director of the Institute for Advanced Studies at Austin, has declared it to be a must read for serious students in the field. Richard has published numerous articles on anomalous phenomena, science, and the intelligence community for UFO magazine. And in 2003, he helped to found Phenomena, a magazine dedicated to leading edge issues pertaining to science and society, and for which he continues to serve as senior editor and regular contributor. So let us now hear how UFO secrecy has damaged American intellectual life and society. Please welcome Richard Dolan. Tracy, it was really nice. Thank you, Tracy. That was a very nice introduction. Thank you. All right, I'm asked to move this because you don't need that to hear me. Um, because we started late, they said I only have 15 minutes. So I'm sorry, it's got to be. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <clears throat> I do want to get started on, on this topic, but I just wanted to uh, update you on a couple of things that I'm doing. For five years, or four years now that I've talked at conferences, everyone said, well, he's written the first volume of this two-volume work. And volume two, I'm happy to tell you, is uh, very close to being done. So I would, I would give it about a year. And, you know, when I, I look back at the, uh, the first book that I wrote, I, I really don't know how I ever got it done. I have no idea. <laughs> so, um, volume two has been much harder to do in the sense that um, my kids are older. I have a lot of other things going on. And, and it was tough to research, but, but I would like to, um, to say that actually, even at this point, I have a vastly more amount of research done for volume two than I did when I wrote the first book. So I'm very happy and I'm optimistic as to how that's going to be. I also want to mention that uh, <clears throat> I just finished a big part of the research for the book in uh, going through, meticulously going through every back issue of the MUFON UFO Journal of the last about 30 years or so. Um, I didn't get the CD. I begged, borrowed, and I well, didn't steal. But I got, I got all these back issues from people who just said, well, let me give you this. Yeah, I've got 1973 to 1980 here. And, and on and on. And I, I went, I've gone through every single issue, looked at every article, annotated every article. My notes of the MUFON journal is itself right now probably a 300-page book. And I can't use all of it for my volume two, but a lot of it will be worked in. And the thing that amazed me is the, uh, the consistent quality of the journal over all of these years. It's been really uh, an irreplaceable resource of information on this topic. So. As a result of that, uh, this is so funny, because when I got into this field, I, I said, well, I don't want to be part of any organization, because I want to be independent, and blah, 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 blah. But I realized I can't keep borrowing issues of the journal, so I, I just joined. I'm a, I might be the newest MUFON member. <laughs> I'm, I'm a member now, so I, I, can, I can pay for my own issues now. 
So that's that. Uh, <clears throat> I, I spoke once at MUFON in 2002 in, in my town of Rochester, New York. Um, and M MUFON has a different, the, the symposiums have a different feel than any of the other uh, conferences that I, I've attended. In the sense that MUFON is different. MUFON is the organization that for th over 30, 35 years has promoted the concept of scientific ufology and has not, has not stopped doing that. I, it's, um, Admirable, it's important, and I'm glad it's been done. But I'm not really a scientist, you know? So when I, when I talk, I mean, I talk about history, and I try to be detached and, and objective about it. But history is not a science. It is not. It's a craft. It has a discipline, but it's not science. And so um, the last time I was at MUFON, I, I felt obligated to talk about science. and. Uh, and I complained about the concept of peer review. Someone after the conference said, you know, you came very dangerously close to being anti-scientific. Uh, what I was was anti-establishment science, actually. My, my point then was, hey, who are the peers going to be doing my review? Who are these people? Peer review is not immune from political considerations, you know. So here for this conference, I'm <clears throat> I was asked to uh, to come up with something you know, neat to talk about. And I made a decision about a, a year ago that at any conference I speak, until my next book is out, I have one theme that I really want to hammer home. And I, I don't want to stop. And it's the theme of, uh, well, I wrote about it. It's uh, on, on the last article that I wrote on my website, which was titled UFO Secrecy and the Death of the American Republic. That's my theme. I feel it's important. and. Uh, because the more I look at the, the problem of UFO secrecy, the more I, I've become convinced that it's a, a significant contributor to the death of the kind of system in society that we all grew up believing that we had. It's not the only killer, but it's one. And it deserves its uh, analysis and understanding along with all the other bad things that are going on in this world today. And so that's what I wanted to talk about. And, and indeed, the theme that I'm dealing with today, I call it how UFO secrecy has damaged intellectual life in society, or life in society. What did I write there? Um, it's basically new, new information. I'm not, I don't just talk about, the, I, I, I don't want ever to um, say the same thing over and over again. Um, but it's a similar theme. What never fails to amaze me regarding this topic, by the way, is how, uh, how marginalized UFO research is. We all know this. But no matter how you look at it, whether from the point of view of pop culture or from the halls of academia and science, uh, this is a topic that don't get no respect. In, uh, in pop culture, I think UFOs are considered a myth in some form or another, typically. Uh, there are, of course, a few people who are in the know, let's say, and they have a different view of this. But I often will feel like I'm kind of howling into a vacuum. I'm sure many of you do as well. I do want to talk a little bit about popular culture. I don't want to spend a lot of, there we go. UFOs as myth. What is popular culture? This man here was a great, great thinker about 150 years ago named Jakob Burkhardt. People think, what is Jakob Burkhardt doing in a UFO convention? I'll, I'll tell you. Burkhardt was a, a very, very great, one of the greatest historians who ever lived. And he was a great philosophical thinker as well. And in the late 19th century, he wrote a, a book, I have a copy of it, called Force and Freedom. And what he did was to do a kind of sociological study of th what he considered to be the three main forces in society that make it go. He called them culture, uh, religion, and the state. And what he did in this study was to uh, kind of understand how they reacted with each other. Now, that was a great idea. But uh, the problem is, when you think of culture today, where, where is, I mean, do we even have an independent culture? I have to wonder this. I wonder about this all the time. Uh, what I see is a culture that is not independent, but rather 
a, uh, something that you know, we're bombarded with by a kind of all pervasive media system, uh, electronic media that's, or print media that's, uh, no matter what you encounter, 90% of what you encounter in the course of a day is owned by one of five corporations globally. And I, I don't see much independent culture anymore. So that the concepts that Burkhart described they don't really apply. But when I, I talk about pop culture and we talk about UFOs, you have to recognize that to a large degree, what we consider to be popular culture is, is a set of concepts that are imposed from above. They're corporate imposed concepts. And it's not simply corporate because when you go to the very top of the structure of power in our society, this is obviously the case that corporate and political powers and intelligence people and so on frequently will work together. How radical is that? 30 years ago, that's a radical statement. Today, it's like, yeah, big deal. We all know this. So gone are the days of Burkhardt, gone are the days of uh, a largely independent culture. And yet, within such a culture, UFOs exist. Uh, you know, how do they exist? Well, they, they're primarily a form of entertainment. I've been on the History Channel a couple of times now, and, and the Sci-Fi Channel every now and then. And don't get me wrong, it's nice getting some publicity, <clears throat> but I have, I have liked very few of the uh, documentaries that I've appeared on. And, uh, and that's the History Channel. They have a great reputation, and, and frankly, I think their quality is um, sorely lacking when you get right down to it. In such a... Uh, context, I want to describe the Peter Jennings UFO special. Oh, I want to show you this, this slide here. What is popular culture? Yeah. I, I love this image. This is, this is from a British publication. That's why BBC and so on. This is how I view popular culture. Am I getting more jaded as I get older? Yeah, maybe. Truth hurts? Oh, yeah, here's what I want to say. Not all media are the same. In the uh, ramp up to the uh, Peter Jennings ABC special last February, a number of people wrote to me and they said, uh, you know, you wrote this article a year ago about UFOs in the media and you said in that article that, you know, mainstream media, it can never, ever, ever uh, give up on the reality of UFOs and yet here's Peter Jennings about to do so. What do you have to say about that? Do you think you need to revise your article? Someone, someone asked me this. And I said, here, here's what's going to happen. It's going to be like a balloon. They're going to inflate the topic for the first hour, and they're going to deflate it for the second. And that's what happened. We all remember this. But, but within that, if I can go back here, uh, not all media are the same. Because, because there's no one society that we live in, right? You have, you look at society in terms of wealth. If you take, if you take this room as, as the United States, let's say there's 100 people here, and, and all the wealth is $100. And if this were a, uh, a communist utopia, we'd all hold hands, sing kumbaya, and have a dollar in our pocket. But of course, in our room, one person has 40 of the dollars. 19 more share another 45, and then the last 80 of you share 15 bucks. And in fact, actually, the last 20 of you have nothing. And the other 60 so have like 25 cents. That's our country. That's most countries. So within that society, and I'm not saying that's right or wrong. That's not my point. But in that room, there's a political system, a legal system, a media, and all these things that make it go. And all you have to do is ask yourself who's in the best position to manipulate these institutions for his benefit. And, right, the answer is implicit in the question. And it, so with media also, what you have to do every, just like with elections every four years, you've got to energize the, the, the bottom classes just enough so that they just barely participate in the way that you want them to, you know, to elect their president. You don't talk about who owns what. You talk about I don't know, abortion or flags or prayer in school or whatever. Things that get people worked up, but that don't really deal with the fundamental structure of power. And media, if you, so, so you have media. There is management-oriented media for the top 10%, let's say. And then there's, there's rabble-oriented media. Management media would be like NPR or... Um, New York Times, uh, Wall Street Journal, Lehrer News Hour, whatever. And maybe rabble media would be, I don't know, Fox News or um, 
New York Post, that kind of thing. And so what I, have, what I argue is that in, in media for the masses, hey, they can do UFOs all they want. History Channel sometimes does rabble media, frankly. Well, just look at the commercials. If they're doing a Burger King ad, and you know what they're targeting, and if they're doing a Lexus commercial, you know what they're targeting. But uh, I, I have argued, and I, I maintain, that in a, a truly, strictly management culture media, they are not going to give you reality of UFOs. They're not going to do it. Management culture requires ideological rigidity. You have to conform. You want to be part of the ruling group? You got to think like the ruling group. And one thing you can't believe in is that aliens are down here doing stuff. That's off, off limits. And so that's, that's the, this thing with the Peter Jennings special. They come down to he said, she said, right? That's what they all come down to. And the main thing about the, the Peter Jennings special, of course, is that there was no hint of conspiracy. In, in the Peter Jennings special, I mean, they dealt with abductions a bit, OK? But there was really, uh, you know, primarily, then they, they bring out the SETI people, and you talk about, well, what if, what if there's life out there? You know, this is how UFOs are dealt with in this infantile, utterly childish manner. Well, we got serious things going on here. No hint of conspiracy, no hint of black world technology, no hint of mass criminality to fund such programs. I mean, think about what, how large the infrastructure of this might be. I'm going to discuss this in a little bit down the road. So um, none of that. That's all off, off the books. Regarding scientific culture, the other, you know, let's leave pop culture for a moment and let's deal with the, um, the more stratified people. UFOs are essentially banished. I will never forget, this is uh, before I left the hallowed world of academia, chatting with a, a professor of history about the Kennedy assassination. Forget UFOs. Kennedy assassination was off limits. This is 1993, 94. And... Uh, this professor was teaching a thing on this Kennedy assassination and arguing for the lone gunman theory, which I did not then subscribe to, nor do I now. And, and you know, I said, well, come on. Are you, are you kidding me here? And we talked a little bit, and he started to look at me. I, I could re recognize the look, and the look was, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist. And I, I stopped, you know. That, that's Kennedy. Can you imagine UFOs in a university? Well, ask David Jacobs. He's talked about this enough. The man, you know, he's had a lot of difficult times over at Temple University because of his interest in this topic. We all know what happened to John Mack at Harvard, who was nearly censured and ruined by his so-called colleagues at Harvard University who were so scandalized, good Lord, that one of their own could, you know, attempt to, to study something as ridiculous as aliens. So within this culture, and this is management culture, right? This is elite management culture, which is why ideological rigidity is so necessary. If you're going to rule, you've got to be part of the club. <sighs> Hence the intense fear to this subject. It's not that they're all in on it. They're just all scared as hell. They don't want to break ranks. The last thing here is that the result of such social pressures on people in science is that they make very, very foolish statements, such as this gentleman here, Seth Shostak, on the Larry King special just the other week. I mean, I wrote this down. I did. I watched it. And here's what he said. They're talking about... Oh, and Susan Clancy, the other one over at Harvard, too. But they, you know, each sounding more foolish than the other. I hope they hear me say this. I'd like them to hear me say this. Uh, for Susan Clancy at Harvard, all abductions are the result of false memory experiences, e even, I guess, apparently, those that don't require regressive hypnosis to uncover, which are many. Uh, <clears throat> and I loved her explanation of the uh, McMinnville photograph the Trent photograph from McMinnville, Oregon, 1950. She says, this is the quote, well, that could have been somebody throwing a disc in the sky. 
And of course, m most of you are aware it was exactly the analysis of Dr. Bruce Maccabee, uh, who was sitting right there on the show, that showed this explanation to be absolutely not credible or even possible. Uh, and later they discussed the, uh, the, the famous Heflin photograph of 1965. Shostak then said, as, as Susan, he says, as Susan has suggested, just a hubcap thrown up and somebody takes pictures. Now at that point, Larry King got on his case and said, come on, that's a pretty amazing picture. And, and Shostak then said, well, it doesn't look like a hubcap, but the point is that there's no point of reference. You don't know how far away that thing is. It could be an aircraft, okay, an aircraft. Uh, you need a couple of cameras, he said. You know, there's all kinds of aircraft. There's something in the sky there. To say it's an alien craft, that's a big step. Okay, that's what he said. Now, but what would be the scientific approach to that? Well, Dr. Shostak, the scientific approach is to ask the right questions. The scientific approach is not to fixate on why it can't be an alien craft. The scientific approach would be to investigate what it could be, okay, to, to inquire. And by the way, that photograph was one of uh, three photographs of the craft, and then a, there was a fourth photograph showing it the trail after it, after it left. So the point is that the banishment of UFO from the world of science and academia causes a lot of stupid things to be said by people with otherwise you know, very nice credentials. There's a, a friend of mine who uh, is a retired professor uh, over out in California at Occidental College, uh, uh, Scott Littleton, great guy. And uh, his story is, you know, typical of people in academia who have an interest in this. Scott's now in his 70s, and he had to wait till he retired until he wrote, his, he wrote a book on this um, because he didn't want to deal with the hassle of, of being within a university environment and having to be a UFO author. And this is how it is. But the thing is, uh, <clears throat> unlike what academicians say and unlike what the scientists say, UFOs are not delusional. They are not nonsense. They are not here solely for the distracted ingestion by the masses. They're real. There, there are some things that we can say very confidently. There are some things that we can't say quite as confidently. What we can say with absolute confidence is that the UFO phenomenon has involved real technology doing real things that are not supposed to be possible. Now that's quite a lot right there, but there's more. This technology, since at least World War II, has engaged in a confrontational and at times provocative manner with US military forces and with military forces of other nations on many occasions. It's involved airspace violations. It's involved alarmed responses. It has elicited the concern of some of the most high, the highest ranking individuals within the military and intelligence community in this nation. So whatever these objects are, they are a matter of national security. That we can say with absolute confidence. We can thank the Freedom of Information Act for a lot of this knowledge. For a, in particular, for a relatively brief period in American history, and I say the late 1970s up until about 1982, the Freedom of Information Act enabled researchers to obtain official documents from government agencies, which clearly demonstrated this. I'm not saying FOIA died after 1982, but Ronald Reagan did ex uh, push through an executive order in 1982, April of 82, that significantly undercut the user-friendly nature of Freedom of Information Act. And as the previous um, um, presenter, Essen uh, Sakher from Turkey, pointed out, a, uh, a Freedom of Information Act request to the US regarding CIA communications with the Turkish intelligence agency on UFOs from just 2002 could neither be confirmed nor denied when, uh, when Larry Bryant, researcher, tried to find out. So the Freedom of Information Act, you know, it's had its ups and downs, and it's in a down phase right now. However, during its up phase, not, not that it was ever easy to get these 
everything out of the government, but it was at least possible. And we all know the story. For years and years and years, FBI, CIA, all the military agencies said, we don't know anything about UFOs. Suddenly, thousands of pages of documents come out proving the lie. And uh, now it's true <clears throat> that among these official release documents, there is not a single smoking gun. There's not a, a memo from the president that says, what are we going to do about these pesky aliens? But there are, there are several documents that are, I would say, a cut, one cut below. Uh, and I'm talking about officially acknowledged documents. I'm not talking about unofficial documents or unacknowledged documents, such as the Majestic Papers, which have been uh, studiously analyzed by many people, most prominently Dr. Robert Wood and his son Ryan Wood, and also Stanton Friedman and other people. Those are unacknowledged documents that look pretty darn real to me, many of them. I'm talking about officially acknowledged documents that the government says, well, yeah, those are ours, okay? And if you look at those, you've got many of these that are, as I say, one cut below the actual smoking gun. They're amazing documents. They describe <clears throat> utterly awesome military encounters with the unexplainable. Take these individually and, and such documents may not prove the existence of UFOs as something alien, okay. After all, people can be you know, prone to mistakes, even military witnesses, they're not perfect. Radar can uh, be faulty or misinterpreted and so on. But you take them as a whole, as a unit. Uh, these released FOIA documents provide a very large body of evidence relating to serious military encounters with UFOs. After you read the first 50 or so of these, uh, you start to wonder. <clears throat> I'm not going to belabor this issue. I have other things that I want to talk about, but I do want to review a few of these documents. I've done this before. Most of you have heard something like this before. Uh, but you know what? There's always people who come to a symposium or a conference who are new to these things. And, and none of us, even someone who's been in this 30 or 40 years, we have to remember that uh, there are fundamental realities here, there are fundamental truths, and it's helpful to remind ourselves of some of them, as well as for someone who's coming here for the first time. And so I want to go over just a couple of the basic, basic documents I want to describe. This one I consider to be a very significant one. This is uh, from Kirtland Air Force Base in New Mexico from January 31st, 1949. It's directed to the U.S. Air Force Chief of Staff there was a flurry of UFO activity going on in New Mexico at this time. The document in question here described yet another of these sightings from the previous day, uh, which had been seen by about 30 people. It states, so I'm going to read it to you, you can read it here, estimate at least 100 total sightings. AEC, AFSWP, 4th Army, local commanders, perturbed by implications of phenomenon all appear to be same object at different points in traje trajectory. Unless instructed to contrary, this office will make all out investigation with view to location of impact point, if any. Okay, all these agencies perturbed by implications of phenomena? That's pretty heavy stuff. Hey, I'd be perturbed too. <laughs> then there's an FBI memo from the same period, in fact, the same day. Same day that the Kirtland memo was issued, we have an FBI special agent sending a memo to FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover. This is a famous memo. It states that the matter of UFOs was considered top secret, that's a direct quote, by intelligence officers of both the Army and Air Forces. No, nothing more needs to be said on that right now. That states enough. Then we have this, a 1950 confidential memorandum with the heading flying disks. This is a remarkable, brief little document. And because it's so brief, I want, to, I want to read each sentence kind of very carefully so you can hear it carefully. Since 30 July, July 30th, objects round in form have been sighted over the Hanford Atomic Energy Commission plant. Okay, next. These objects reportedly were above 15,000 feet in altitude. Air Force jets attempted interception with negative results. Now, listen to this. All units 
including the anti-aircraft battalion, radar units, Air Force fighter squadrons, and the Federal Bureau of Investigation have been alerted for further observation. Next, the Atomic Energy Commission states that the investigation is continuing and complete details will be forwarded later. Okay. Now, where are the academic historians regarding this memo? Failed intercepts? Anti-aircraft battalions? And whatever happened to the uh, investigation and report that was alluded to in the memo? Well, I suspect that the answer to that last question might be contained in the, uh, in the wording of the, of the FBI memo I quoted you earlier that was sent to Hoover, which stated that the matter of UFOs was considered top secret. Top secret. And yet, we have to remember, Stanton Friedman's pointed this out a number of times. Let me point it out, too. Of the thousands of UFO-related documents that we have gotten through the, through the Freedom of Information Act, only the smallest handful of highly censored documents were actually top secret. Uh, the rest were typically classified as either restricted or confidential or at most secret. And these are all lower levels of secrecy, in other words. So that the, if the, this report was ever made and was top secret, uh, perhaps you know, it would look something like this to us, right? All that white that's whited out. Despite the best efforts of uh, Freedom of Information Act researchers, the best reports and best intelligence remain far removed from the public domain. Despite what people had hoped back in the day, the glory era of, of uh, the late 70s, uh, the Freedom of Information Act has not turned out to be a magic bullet. It's also fairly obvious that UFO secrecy involves classifications higher than top secret. Now, if higher classifications themselves are classified, who knows how far they go? James Bamford wrote the book Body of Secrets. It's a study of the National Security Agency. Very, very good book. He writes, like an endless spiral, there are secret classification systems within secret classification systems. Just pause for a moment and reflect on that. Okay. Now, what we do know is that a Canadian government official back in the 1950s, Wilbert Smith, wrote, actually he wrote in 1950, many of you know this, he said he had made discreet inquiries through the Canadian embassy staff in Washington and learned that the subject of UFOs was, quote, the most highly classified subject in the United States government. That's what Smith wrote. The last of the early memos I want to show you, this is it, I don't want to, I've got other things. But I want you to see this. This is uh, from Robbins Air Force Base in, um, in Macon, Georgia. It's dated July 9th, 1951. This describes a 10-minute aerial UFO encounter that took place in the early afternoon. The pilot was a first lieutenant. He was flying an F-51 on a routine flight from Lawson Air Force Base in Columbus, Georgia. Not far from Augusta, Georgia, he encountered an object that he said was flat on top and bottom and appearing from a front view to have rounded edges and slightly beveled. That's a lot of detail. At one point, the object dived while in front of the pilot's view. And when it did that, he said it appeared, quote, completely round and spinning in a clockwise direction. Again, it's a lot of detail in his report here. Continues, he says, the report says, from front view, as object dived, observer noted small spots on the object. Object did not appear to be aluminum. Only one object was observed, solar white. No vapor trails or exhaust or visible system of propulsion. Described as traveling at tremendous speed. That's all a direct quote from the memo. The object eventually disappeared under his plane. And when it, when it uh, went under his plane, he felt a bump. He, he said in this report. He thought it was about 10 or 15 feet in diameter. He said he got to within about three or 400 feet of it. I mean, it's just incredible detail. And it's one of the uh, legacies. Uh, I, I would argue it's the legacy of Watergate that we know about it. 
because it was as a result of Watergate and the, the end of Vietnam, I think, that the Freedom of Information Act was strengthened. And as a result of that, we get reports like this. It's very easy, you know, that we could not have gotten it. I mean, the people who made these reports back in the 50s, I, I would imagine they had no idea that these would see the light of day one day. So <clears throat> there are other documents like the ones I've been showing you, but expanding on this I think would be pointless. You get the idea. Taken as a group, they establish that during this early period, at the very least, there were quite a few events that were recorded and classified by American military and intelligence personnel that they took seriously. And it is not hard to understand why. Now let's make things a little more interesting and uh, depart from what is proven beyond a doubt to what the situation looks like, okay? In other words, let's analyze. What were these early UFOs? Were they Soviet? Maybe developed with the help of uh, captured German scientists, some of whom appear to have been experimenting with disc-shaped uh, aircraft, okay? U.S. intelligence looked into this. Now, this is a, um, <clears throat> you know, a tricky issue even to this day. Regarding the Soviet part of it, the answer seemed to be no. It seems to be no to me today as well. In other words, did the Soviets invent flying saucers after World War II or during World War II? Doesn't look like it. What about the Americans, though? What about the Americans? I mean, the Americans captured a lot of those smart German scientists. Well, people have been looking at this one for a long time as well. And, you know, I don't know if I have the full answer on this. I don't know if anyone really does. Uh, the author, Nick Cook, let me show you his book right there. This book came out after mine did. I, I wish it didn't because I would have incorporated a lot of it in, but that's, that's life. Uh, Nick Cook was the senior aviation editor for Jane, Jane's Defense Weekly. It's about as mainstream conservative elite as you get. And he looked into this. And uh, he wanted to know, you know, did, did the Germans ex uh, create flying saucers? In his field, he said, we call it the legend. Uh, well, it becomes clear when reading his book that there was very, very interesting research being done by the Germans during World War II in things like gravity research, for example. Uh, even Nick Cook speculated time travel. Time travel. It's in there. That's important because, <clears throat> as many of you realize, he's a careful guy. Uh, but it has to be emphasized that what he found, I mean, he did find some smoke, in other words, concepts and drawing board stuff. He did not find fire. He did not find evidence of anything operational, in other words. Not during, now I'm talking about the 1940s and 50s. He speculated that it was possible that a major breakthrough would have occurred as, as possibly as early as the 1960s, Oh, but even there, he was, he was somewhat noncommittal. What documentation we have indicates serious efforts going on in anti-gravity starting in the mid-1950s. If anything started sooner than this, we have no documentary evidence. That's not to say it did not happen. But if it did, I'm not aware of, of documents that show this research earlier than that. And if any of you know of it, I would like to know. Now, the other problem that I have with the theory of flying saucers as, as a, some kind of deep black US project, at least in the early years, my problem is, why were so many of these encounters with US military personnel so provocative, so confrontational? That 1951 pilot encounter that I mentioned to you, for instance, um, or the many intrusions that really got uh, base commanders worked up. Um, to me, this just, I have a hard time understanding how this makes sense as a deep black covert project that would go for years and years and years to, to do this, to, to screw with American military personnel in this manner. I don't understand that. And again, if someone does, I, I would truly like to know. I'm not being facetious. I'd like to know. Now, you can always speculate that there's a truly rogue human group that invented or obtained uh, radically advanced technology, I mean a group beyond the control of official militaries and official governments, okay? And indeed, it is my feeling that such 
has become the case today. I say feeling, I cannot prove this. Could it be the answer to the sightings of the 1940s and 1950s? Uh, I'll concede it's possible, but there remains a matter of evidence, and uh, I am not aware of any. Now, that's a conservative interpretation of the situation that is a, a human solution, and it's not exactly conservative. The more radical interpretation, of course, is that this technology was not human in origin at all. Either way, this is obviously a serious matter to very serious people. I said I wasn't going to show, it, show you any other documents, but I, I guess I forgot. I want to show you this very briefly. H. Marshall Chadwell uh, was the CIA's deputy of uh, director of scientific intelligence in 1952. Uh, <clears throat> that was a year that UFO sightings were getting rather out of hand, you might say, not just public, but a lot of military encounters as well. Uh, you can imagine that concern happened at very high levels. This is the year, of course, that UFOs were seen over the White House and made the front page of the New York Times and on and on and on. Okay, we only have really a handful of documents and statements that have come down to us from, from that summer. A uh, couple of books, few reports, and memos, that's about it. But this is one of them, and it speaks volumes. It's a very brief document prepared by Chadwell for his boss, CIA director, Walter Beetle Smith. Smith, who was, by the way, the chief of staff for Eisenhower during the war. Memos dated December 2nd, 1952. Chadwell was careful. The man was not a fool. He didn't come out and say, boss, we're being invaded. Here's the relevant paragraph. At this time, the reports of incidents convince us that there is something going on that must have immediate attention. Sightings of unexplained objects at great altitudes and traveling at high speeds in the vicinity of major U.S. defense installations are of such nature that they are not attributable to natural phenomena or known types of aerial vehicles. Wow. It takes your breath away. Not natural phenomena, not known types of vehicles, and not apparently uh, U.S. manufactured. Didn't seem like it in that memo. Didn't appear to be Soviet. So what does that leave you with? And it leaves you with someone's technology snooping around American airspace. This is clearly a matter of grave concern to the decision makers of America's defense and intelligence policy. With that in mind, we must assume that the public statements repeated over and over and over, flying saucers exist only in the imagination, there are nothing to them, hoaxes or misidentifications of natural whatever, okay? That these are intentional acts of deception. Intentional acts of deception. Now, you can defend that if you wish. You can say the government's trying to prevent mass panic if you want to do that, or, or hide its knowledge from the Soviets, okay? Or maybe something else equally portentous, all right? But before you draw that conclusion, let's go a little further. I'd like you to imagine, as we continue, a sleeping bear in the corner of the dining room that no one's allowed to talk about. Just sit quietly and eat your dinner. That's what this reality is. Now, the Freedom of Information Act documents, as, as important as they are, are not the whole story. Unfortunately, we're, you know, we're a bit of a handicap here. Uh, I just can't walk into the Pentagon and say, hey, you know, can I take a look at these things? Can't walk into CIA. A certain number of documents, though, have been obtained to review. It's true. But in reality, this is like the, the um, spray of the ocean, where the actual ocean is still roped off. So you, we have to be resourceful. You can't just be a historian. You have to be a journalist. You have to seek out people who have something to say on this matter. You have to judge their credentials. You have to check their facts. You have to try to keep piecing the story together. This is not an infallible process. Everyone knows this, but it's necessary. And you have to rely on your best judgment and your sense of caution throughout. And thus we come to the strong reason to believe that UFOs are a lot more than just objects flying around in the sky, but are in fact retrieved technology that is being stored and studied and perhaps duplicated 
at secret bases. We come to this likelihood that there are alien bodies as well that have been studied by human scientists. And we come to this amazing conclusion because more than 50 years of history point inexorably toward it. There is Roswell, of course. You know, Roswell, because it's so rich, so full of uh, witness testimony, so portentous for its implications. Debunking it has been an absolute priority since the case arose. Roswell will not, will not go away, however, despite the recent ABC effort to do so. But even if you want to ignore Roswell, if you insist on ignoring Roswell, in my opinion, it doesn't really matter, all right? It, there have been multiple retrievals of UFO technology by the US military, many. Some of the best known, were, you have Kingman, Arizona, 1953. You got Las Vegas in 1962. You got Kecksburg, Pennsylvania in 1965. That's, there are many others, okay, um, in which US military teams worldwide have been retrieving what are genuine UFOs. People have leaked information about this from time to time. Uh, I mentioned Wilbert Smith a little while ago. Well, he made another remarkable statement on this. He said, uh, shortly before he died, uh, in the very early part of the 1960s, Smith said that uh, during the great wave of UFO sightings in 1952, US military shot off a piece of a flying saucer near DC. He said that the Air Force, the US Air Force had loaned him a small piece for a very short time, in his words. He showed it to his friend, US Navy Rear Admiral H.B. Uh, Knowles. When Smith was asked, if he returned the piece to the Air Force, he replied, he said, not the Air Force, much higher than that. He was asked, well, it was at the CIA. And he chuckled. And he said, I'm sorry, gentlemen. I don't care to go beyond the, that point. I can say to you, it went into the hands of a highly classified group. You will have to solve that problem, their identity for yourselves. Claims and statements have been going around for years regarding the storage of alien bodies at secure facilities, most notably Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. During the late 1970s, UFO researcher and World War II veteran Leonard Stringfield began to look closely into uh, this, what, and he started calling it the crash retrieval syndrome. People contacted him anonymously. He followed leads. Well, they weren't anonymous to him, but you get the idea. They didn't want their identities known. He uncovered a lot of people. By the early 1980s, Stringfield had spoken to about 20 first-hand, first-hand military informants who had either worked on a UFO crash retrieval or seen alien bodies in storage. And he had also talked to another 30 or so who were direct intermediaries. By all accounts, Leonard Stringfield was a very careful researcher. There he is, right there. He honored his promise to protect the identities of the people who came to him. He never jumped to conclusions about what they told him. He always considered the possibility that he was being played, as he, as he said. But he ultimately believed that the sources were too widespread. They did not appear to be coordinated. They appeared to be genuine. And the information appeared to be legitimate in his, in his judgment. Collectively, they told a story of several crash retrievals of alien vehicles by US military personnel. They told the story of the housing of bodies and the study of technology at deeply classified levels. I'm going to skip by the next thing here. It's not necessary for me to. Oh, no, I do want to talk about this. I'm sorry. Edgar Mitchell, I'm, I think we're all very sorry that he cannot be here at this conference this weekend. I, I personally missed the chance to talk to him again. But let's talk a little bit about Edgar Mitchell. <sighs> you know, he's been, he's talked publicly about this for a couple of years. I'm not telling you anything he hasn't said. Uh, he has said that he has more than one elite connection. Now, look, when you're a moonwalking astronaut, who's not going to want to talk to you, right? So you can basically talk to anybody you want. And he's got some pretty important friends. 
Uh, he said two of these very elite individuals confirmed to him independently of each other the existence of deep black programs to study alien technology and bodies. Edgar Mitchell said this. Good grief. Where's the media on this? I mean, it's as if Neil Armstrong were to say it because they're in the same club. And where, where is this? There was a, a, an article um, in the uh, St. Petersburg, Florida Times a little over a year ago that described this and, I mean, I utterly trivialized it. The, the entire import of what he said was utterly lost. Uh, so you have to wonder, you know, is, there, is it just incompetence or is there something else going on? Well, I want to, uh, let's keep going here. It's just, you know, the secrecy on this is so unbelievable. And I think that it's part and parcel of an apparatus that is just absolutely mammoth, but which does not exist officially. Richard Sauter, Dr. Richard Sauter, uh, whom I like personally very much, and I have a tremendous amount of respect for him, he has documented the existence of an enormous system of underground bases and even tunnels that stretch throughout the United States. That's what it looks like. Some of his research has pointed toward the likelihood of a massive shadow government, so important, so powerful, that it appears to have authority over the real government. Richard's careful. He doesn't say definitely this is the case, but that's what it looks like. And I can tell you, I have a friend. He's a military attache. He lives in DC. He's got a very high uh, government level. He hangs out with admirals and, you know, big shots like that. He told me a story. He has a, he has a friend who's a senior congressional aide with significant budgetary uh, review responsibilities. After a long period of number crunching, this aide came to the conclusion that there existed an enormous black arm of the US government. That is an utterly secret arm, an executive arm of government, OK? A substantial, powerful, expensive, and secret executive branch of the US government. And in the opinion of this congressional aide, he believed that it was connected to UFOs. I was unable to get any further information about this person. I'm sorry. I wish I could. There's an even more suggestive link to the deep black world and the possibility of alien technologies and bodies. And this is uh, a woman who is the former Assistant Secretary of Housing and Urban Development under the administration of George Bush in the early 1990s, uh, 41st President, Papa, Poppy Bush. This is Catherine Austin Fitz, who, uh, after leaving government, has become, in my opinion, one of the leading uh, analysts of, uh, of the black budget. She wrote a great article called What's Up With The Black Budget. I would encourage every one of you to read it. Just Google it, and you'll find it. She described a meeting, listen to this. She described a meeting she had in 1998, this is after she left the Bush administration, right? With uh, John Peterson, who was head of the Arlington Institute, a very important military think tank, okay, in, in Washington. She says, according to the, she, that he asked her to help him on a high level strategic plan that the Institute was working on for the Undersecretary of the Navy. Here are her words to the meeting. There's Catherine Alston Fitz. I'm going to read it to you. She says, I met with a group of high-level people in the military in the process, including the Undersecretary. According to John, the purpose of the plan discussed in front of several military or retired military officers and former government officials was to help the Navy adjust their operations for a world in which it was commonly known that aliens exist and live among us. John asked me if I would like to meet some aliens. John asked me if I would like to meet some aliens. For the only time in my life, I declined an opportunity to learn about something important. I was concerned that my efforts with Arlington could boomerang. I regret that decision. I, I've spoken to her. I've done a little bit of email and a couple of phone chats with Kath, Catherine Austin Fitz. And uh, aside from being an absolutely brilliant person, uh, 
she, she is very down to earth, frankly. Um, very nice, very, very real. And she stands by what she said. People have uh, asked John Peterson to confirm this, and he will not, he will not confirm this meeting. Uh, so <clears throat> even this is only a partial picture, but the story is starting to look clearer. Let's cut with Occam's razor, and I think the simplest explanation, as I see it, is something like this. During and immediately after World War II, US military personnel began encountering exotic, unconventional, and extraordinary craft. It quickly became apparent to the best and brightest minds that these did not come from the Soviet Union. They did not come from here. They figured it out. They certainly concluded that the true UFOs did not come from our civilization. Hardly willing to share this information with others, secrecy became the rule. Now, at some point very early on, alien technology and bodies were recovered. It would be of paramount importance to determine several things as quickly as possible. A, the intentions of these others, whatever they want. B, how to exploit their technology. C, how to keep the information away from undesirable groups, which I guess would be just about everybody. Now, the reason for secrecy is going to be a lot more than just preventing mass panic or stopping you from jumping out of your window, OK? It's not, to, it's not for public protection. I just do not believe this. Maybe in the beginning, maybe in the very beginning, there was a kind of war of the world's fear scenario, like what happened with Orson Welles. Uh, maybe people were afraid of panic. But you know what? Secrecy grows its own tentacles, and it develops its own reasons for self-preservation. And I believe that by the 1950s, it's quite possible that the office of the presidency was beginning to lose control over UFO secrecy. I mean, imagine being one of these people charged with managing the, the UFO problem. OK, you've got to keep it secret. You have to keep it so secret, you have to basically hide it from yourself, in a way. Uh, there's layer upon layer of deception that follows. False cover story on top of false cover story. We can assume that the technology itself would have to be amazingly advanced, maybe hopelessly so, compared with maybe what we had in 1950. But maybe, you know, maybe after a few years, one clever scientist comes up with a really cool idea based on one aspect of the recovered technology not only an incalculable technological advantage in the Cold War, but hey, hell of a ground floor investment opportunity. And over the years, much of the UFO information would have gone, I think, to private channels. Good way to keep secrets. It's immune from government, uh, from public in, you know, inquiry. It becomes proprietary. I mean, look, this has happened with so many other aspects of the military. Our military has become privatized in, in almost every conceivable way, including combat duties. Not, I mean, in Iraq and, and elsewhere in the world. Why not with the UFOs? You got Wack and Hut. I mean, there's private contractors who are, who are dealing with this and who do get the information. If I'm, if I'm a senior Air Force guy and I don't want anyone to have these UFO documents, hey, maybe I'll give them to a buddy of mine in General Motors or at Lockheed or some other place. And I'll say, hey, you know, hang on to these, please, OK? And they become impossible to get. But they become, they, they're still within you know, general circulation among the people who really need to know. I think that's how it works, frankly. Now, the value of this technology, I think, potentially, and certainly in reality, is immense. I spoke to a, a man. He's not anonymous. He's a real guy, and he's got real black world credentials. He said to me, he's a tough guy. I wouldn't want to mess with him, to be honest with you. He's, and it was in his 60s mid-60s. He says, you know what they're guarding out at Area 51? They're guarding money. <laughs> An enormous amount of money. Money, he said, in the form of immensely valuable alien technology. And something else seems to have occurred along the way. According to the former head of Lockheed Skunk Works, the late Ben Rich, apparently, direct control over the UFO problem was removed from the US presidency around 1969, maybe. Since that time, private international channels have been dominant. I can't, who can confirm this? No one. I can't confirm this. But it, it would be consistent with the ascendancy of international uh, corporations and international elites over most other aspects of global power. Why not this? 
What it looks like is that UF, UFO secrecy has led to the establishment of a secret network which controls access to ET technology. The network is international, but it uses substantial resources of the US black budget and other secret military groups as a primary tool to engineer exotic technologies that enable it to maintain scientific, military, and economic superiority. Yes, that's what it looks like. So we need to re-examine the major events of our history, and we need to try to understand them in light of this. UFO reality makes our actual history vastly different from what we have been taught in the standard books. With the existence of a secret and extremely powerful group controlling this subject and everything that concerns it, a massive disinformation network has become necessary for them. Who knows how far this disinformation has gone? This in itself is a critical part of the reason UFO secrecy has helped to kill off the American Republic. Such levels of deception go beyond mere secrecy, and they make it necessary to toss out the old system in all but name. I'm not done with that theme, but let me continue. Science bought and paid for. You know, we, we always tend to think about, about concepts in, we're, we're, we're outdated. By the time we become adults, we're usually thinking about the world in terms of outdated concepts because we tend to maintain the concepts that we're taught about the world that we learn in our youth or in our formative period. But the problem is that life keeps going, and we sometimes don't keep up, especially during periods of rapid change like this one. It's an unavoidable problem. We remain wedded to the concepts of the past, of our youth. Reality races ahead. You look at our cultural attitudes towards science. You know, we think of science as a bastion, uh, indeed, the foundation of intellectual freedom in the world. That's what we tell ourselves. We think of science as a, an independent search for truth, as the destroyer of social and religious myths and prejudices. But how independent is science? How independent are scientists? Maybe that's a better question. In whose interest is science practiced today? It's not an idle question. We don't have days of scientists just following uh, their intellectual passions in the search for truth. A couple of years ago, I came across this statement by uh, one of the pioneers in environmental science, if you can show that on the screen there, James Lovelock. Lovelock was in his 80s when he wrote this. This is what he wrote. Nearly all scientists are employed by some large organization, such as a government department, a university, or a multinational company. Only rarely are they free to express their science as a personal view. They may think that they're free, but in reality, they are nearly all of them employees. They have traded freedom of thought for good working conditions, a steady income, tenure, and a pension. He's not even talking about UFOs. He's just talking in general here. Hey, science is expensive. You need sponsorship. One thing I, try, I have tried to do is to get a sense of who is paying for scientific research in this country and in this world, what projects get the most funding. I wish I'd started this research a little earlier because it's, it's hard, it's complicated. I'm having a hard time with this. Uh, it's very difficult to or get organized or to organize data around for who's paying for scientific research in the US, much less the world. I am sure someone has done this research and I haven't yet found it. But what is obvious to me, oh, time's up? Good grief, man. Has this, has this been an hour, an hour? Let's start a riot. I saw Timothy Leary speak many, many years ago at the University of Rochester, and he nearly did start a riot. It was the greatest, wonderful thing. Well, guys, I, I'm really, I'm not even, uh, let me, I, I've got to wrap this up. I'm, let me just skip to one. Well, I, okay, all right, very quickly. I'm not gonna, I'm, hell with these notes, forget this. <laughs> keep, keep the screen though, could you just put this on? Please, please, thank you. UFO research, who's paying for this? US federal budget, fiscal year 2006 is $2.5 trillion, guys. How much goes to UFO research? That's a zero, zero. 
Now, black budget, ah, different story. Different story. I don't know how much money is going to it. I'll bet you a lot. And what is the black budget? Catherine Austin Fitz talks about this at great length. I really encourage you to search her, go to her website, and read about this. She is the most insightful person on this whole topic, in my opinion. She says, she argues, it's not just secret federal money, as was argued, let's say, by Tim Weiner 15 years ago in his book on the black budget. Weiner said, yeah, you know, it's secret federal money. Okay, well, there's more. There's narco-trafficking. Yeah, very, very definite. There's securities fraud. There's a lot of money going on. You've got, uh, just before 9-11, Rumsfeld's before Congress, trying to explain why $1.1 trillion, $1.1 trillion was unaccounted for, they called it undocumentable expenses, in the Pentagon in fiscal year 2000. The budget for the Pentagon that year was $350 billion. How are you going to get $1.1 trillion going through the Pentagon in that year? Where'd the money come from? Where'd it go? We don't know. Then came 9-11. Now you can't ask. Now you literally cannot find out. Okay? I had much, much more I wanted to discuss, but I'm going to be able to wrap it up. Here's what I want to say. We... Uh, what has happened is the secrecy on UFOs has required control by a very elite group of people to, to circumvent this standard form of government that we all thought we had, okay? And what happens over a long enough period of time is you go farther and farther away from what you officially have and what really you have, and at a certain point, just like the stock market has to have a correction when you have economic realities all screwed up with each other, same thing with politics. You have a correction. 9-11 provided that correction. Whether you want to think it was an inside job or not, let's not even discuss that right now, although I've, I've gotten myself into trouble on that. But, but that's not even necessary here, okay? The correction. After 9-11, we have seen a new form of government come down in this country. Make no mistake. And it's a correction, just like, like economics. Because the real form of government had already gone so far beyond what we thought we had, that um, the correction was necessary for those who rule. You know, you, this way, now, now you know, your Fourth Amendment right to privacy is gone, of course. Maybe it was gone before 9-11, but now it's officially gone, and things like that, okay? It's not like the government wasn't doing all kinds of bad things before, but now they're just allowed to do it more officially. Last thing I want to say about disclosure. I mentioned this once before. Maybe you've heard it, but nevertheless, I think of the analogy, very, very strong analogy with the old Soviet Union. Remember 1985, Mikhail Gorbachev comes to power. Glasnost, perestroika. Hey, man, that's great. Gorby's Man of the Year twice by Time Magazine. Six years later, no more Soviet Union. Goodbye. What happened? I'll tell you what happened. I know what happened. Okay? He comes up, revolutionizes society, openness. People say, hey, great, man. We don't want to be in this country. We're gone. You took us over in 1940, remember? And Gorby is saying, no, no, no. I didn't mean that. Well, it's too late. Reforms spiraled out of control in such a manner the President of the United States cannot cannot, must not ever come up and say, uh, sorry, uh, come to my attention, aliens apparently are here, UFOs appear to be real. You can't just leave it at that. I mentioned this in the talk last night. You, you cannot just, you can't half disclose. You can't be half pregnant, you can't half disclose. Because if you, if you start bringing out disclosure, okay, everything connected with it comes out too. The massive illegality that, that what appears to be connected to UFO secrecy is going to come out. It's going to come out. And when that comes out, all hell is going to break loose. That's not a reason not to do it. That's a reason to do it. Someone, someone has got, we have got to force their hand. That's what good research is all about. That's what I am trying to do. That is what other good people here are trying to do. Thank you very much. Sorry. I, I, I've loved it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm out of here. Oh, I have to. Yes.